Hello there, my name is Lisette Coley, and I'm the Executive Director of Parapsychology Foundation, and I have the happy privilege of being seated within the Eileen Garrett Research Library with Dr. Rex Stanford today on June, what's today, the 13th, 13th. I think, uh, 2002. So, Rex, can you give me your uh, present affiliation? Present affiliation is Department of Psychology, St. John's University. There you go. There you go. Well, uh, I know you've been in the field for many years and uh, have uh, achieved certainly a level of prominence being past president of the Parapsychological Association and in light of all your or research. Could you give me a little bit about your educational background? What led you to being working in the field? Yes. I would say that uh, when I was in high school, I got very interested in what makes the universe run. Physics. I started studying physics. I uh, was interested in theoretical physics and astrophysics, things like that. Wanted to know what this world is like in a very basic way, and I, I sort of felt that physics had answers that were very uh, interesting and gave deep insights into what's happening in the world. And um, I was working in that kind of area, and I'm working, I wasn't doing physics as such, but as a high school student, but mm -hmm. uh, I was studying it, okay? And I happened to be presenting some papers at the uh, Junior Academy of Sciences meeting, uh, Texas Junior Academy of Sciences meeting, and I ran into a fellow who was presenting on parapsychology. Turns out we became fast friends and started doing EFP experiments together. Reason why was that I started reading J.B. Ryan's works whom, that I heard about from this fellow, and, um, and I said, golly, if J.B. Ryan is right, then there's something really remarkable here that tells us about the nature of the world. So it was a thought that parapsychology, because it deals with unexplained phenomena, may cast a new light on the nature of reality. So that's what led me into it. And of course, parapsychology is a science, and I assumed, as J.B. Ryan did, that science is a way to find out about this. Mm -hmm, and that led you on the path. And that, that subsequently, uh, I felt, I come to believe that uh, studying works in parapsychology, that psychology, PhD in psychology with an experimental emphasis would be a good way to get into the field. So that's so how somehow you've left the physics behind and... Uh... Yeah, I left the physics behind um, in, the se in the interest of trying to find out more about parapsychology as such. Mm -hmm. And uh, curiously, the, the reason that I went in the direction of psychology, aside from the fact that I find psychology itself fascinating, uh, is that what parapsychologists seem to be learning about psi phenomena had to do with what goes on in people's heads when they do ESP tests or when they're having an ESP experience in the real world. In other words, it seemed like psychological factors seem to govern the occurrence of psi phenomena. So I thought you'd better study psychology and its methods if you want to study that domain. So you really had it in your head that parapsychology is what was uh, really driving your educational undergraduate work or not really? This was just a question that was there, interesting to I contemplate? I, or? I started my undergraduate work with the explicit thought of getting a PhD in psychology and uh, devoting myself, at least a major part of my work, to uh, parapsychology. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, mm -hmm. from day one, there was mm -hmm. no doubt about mm -hmm. that. I had already uh, done a number of experiments in parapsychology and uh, had presented uh, parapsychology experiments at the junior section of Texas Academy of Sciences before I ever started to be really? Texas at Oxford. Did you catch any flack for it, as a, or were you just odd I mean, man out? There are, I mean, there are always some people who are, are skeptical, but no, I wouldn't say I would have caught any more flack than I would probably presenting in, in any area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Besides, people give, uh, give uh, uh, high school students an opportunity to make mistakes. <laughs> well, that's true. There's a lot of latitude. You probably thought parapsychology was a big mistake. Oh, well, listen, my, my, my sixth grader just did her high school, her, her sixth grade science project on what is ESP, so I think oh. that's, yes, okay, maybe there's a fourth generation waiting in the wings. You never, you never can tell. <laughs> so where did you get your uh, degree then in psychology? The University of Texas at Austin, and uh, I did my dissertation uh, in an area that would have to be called cognitive psychology. Mm -hmm. And I also did research there uh, as, a, as a graduate student in uh, social psychology. Mm -hmm. And then you went on to do your graduate work there uh, also? Or? Uh, well, th that, that, was, that was a PhD work. The, the dissertation was, was, oh, was, PhD. was in a cognitive psychology area based on uh, word association methodology, exploring the way people's minds are organized internally with regard to words. Mm -hmm. That was the topic of the PhD dissertation. Uh, I must add that in terms of education, it would not be at all fair to, to stop my education with just the University of Texas at Austin, because uh, as an undergraduate, even, I made contact with J.B. Ryan and my friend, whom I mentioned earlier, uh, 
had uh, at this is at I, what age? Th this would have been as an undergraduate. As an undergraduate. As, as an undergraduate. Uh, we went to visit Ryan's lab several summers, and uh, very soon uh, Ryan was offering me uh, fellowships to come up for the summer and do research and things really? like that. Really, that's and pretty so heady stuff. And so I got a lot of training directly yeah. from J.B. Ryan. And this continued, uh, I forgot when the first summer When would this have been, was. in the 60s? Uh, I completed 60s? my undergraduate degree in 64, uh, summer uh -huh. of 64. So. And I think I had one fellowship perhaps in 64, but that continued 65, 66. And then I came there to his laboratory uh, briefly in 67, after I got my doctorate. I see, I see. And it was a real learning experience, not just from J.B. Rand, but I must also say from his uh, wife, Louisa, who happens yes. to be one of the people that I have a great deal of respect for. I think so. She She's sort of unsung in the in, in history of parapsychology, and uh, I think it'll be proven that uh, she had a very large voice that should have been echoed a little louder, yeah. for sure, for sure. So how long were you actually working then with the Rhines? Well, actually working with them, I started, you know, formal work, I guess, when I came for the summer fellowship, I think it was the summer of 64. And uh, so there was those 64, 65, 66, and 67 for summer months, largely, uh, I would say. So that would have been you know, a total of about a, a year's actual work mm -hmm. there. But before that, several times we had gone to visit him and talked with all the workers. And it was just tremendous to have contact with people who were actively researching the field. It was very exciting. It, mm -hmm. it, it, uh, and you were in good company. It seems that the, the people that you were with, right, if we can discuss a few of them, are really parapsychology's greats now, looking uh, looking back, well, yes. that you all were Toward together? Toward the end of my work with, with J.B. Ryan, we had a, a phenomenal group of people together. Chuck Honerton, Bob Morris, John Palmer uh, among the leading lights. Yes. Good God. I wonder why, why um, Rex, do you think that you all can stayed in the field when, you know, uh, it's so, youth is so capricious and, uh, you know, a lot of people drift in and out of our field as in any other field, and why you guys in that time area or whatever really made your mark and went on to continue to make your mark in parapsychology. Do you think it's because of the imprimatur of the Rhines or what, well, why? what do you think I, I, I think that had something to do with it. Uh, Rhine, uh, although one may, as I do, disagree with him on a lot of points about the field. Nonetheless, he was a man who had something like almost religious faith in the validity of the methods of science. That mm -hmm. it was possible to come to grips with these difficult to even think about type of phenomena, inscrutable kinds of phenomena almost, uh, with scientific methodology. And uh, he was a man that made that bold claim. And he had some evidence to back it up that mm -hmm. uh, you know he could to some degree. Now that was tremendously exciting. Uh, Ryan was not exciting as a theoretician, to me certainly at least, and I don't think he would have thought of himself predominantly as a theoretician, more of a, a sort of a, a dry bones empiricist. Mm -hmm. Let's have the data. And, uh, but nonetheless, uh, I think it's that kind of excitement, first of all, of contact with the established experimental parapsychologist that uh, sort of inspires you to think maybe you can follow suit and make some mm -hmm. contributions yourself, and his belief and the possibility of doing so is something that I think inspired every last one of us. And I also got to say that I think one of the reasons that all of us stayed in the field and had some success in it is that we had good grounding in psychology programs. First. Yes, yes. All of us went to school in very good schools with very excellent psychology programs. And I really think that has helped all of us mm -hmm. making our country. So you had the, the tools in the valise we and had then the tools. you could go we forward. Had, yes, we had the, we had the, the people come to connect with the people, and some of our professors outside of parapsychology have been tremendous inspirations in terms of models for scientific mm -hmm. thinking and research. Well, there were a lot of people trooping through the lab in those days, too, right? Were there a lot of visiting firemen? I mean, was it a cross-section? I, I know Aldous Huxley was down there. I know Garrett was down there. there. I mean, always was there a whole cross-section? I cannot recall precisely who all the visitors were that came through in the summer when we were there, mm. to be honest. But uh, a lot of people moved through his laboratory. Um, it's interesting because um, there were people who would come there and would leave or just have some contact with Ryan. But uh, people often didn't stay long, for one thing. Ryan had his own ideas about the way things were done. Mm -hmm. so not, a, lot of, a lot of us who entered the field of press, you've you got to be sort of uh, a rugged individualist in a way. To, to carve the, the uh, territory out. Going in the face of kind of uh, sometimes academic scientific opposition, this kind uh -huh. of thing. And so people often have their own ways of doing things and their own approaches to things. And, um, but 
that doesn't mean that people, the many people came through there were not greatly benefited by the contact with, with, with the man. But it must Dr. have been, Ryan. you must have been exposed to an awful rich mix of ideas, too. It must have been exciting. I mean, was it, I mean, it wasn't just purely the experimental method. There must no, have been all there, sorts there, of... There were, there were all kinds of people that, that we met connected with Ryan's uh, work, his, with, his, with his laboratory. Of course, there was his wife's side, which concerned the spontaneous cases. There were all sorts of people in the lab who had different sorts of orientations and interest in the field uh, with their own individual projects. Uh, we had people ranging from mystical orientations to rather experimental psychologist types of orientations uh, who were all doing empirical work, though, within parapsychology. So it was an intriguing group of people. And, uh, an Sounds like an time. interesting point in time that perhaps in nowadays, I mean, what would be the closest proximity to that? Maybe Edinburgh, Bob's efforts with students? I mean, it doesn't really exist anymore, does it? Well, to it, that extent? Well, or maybe I not being on the vanguard. Must no? exist at Edinburgh. And, uh, and there still is a summer studies program, mm -hmm. as I understand mm -hmm. it, at, uh, the Rhine Center at, at the Rhine Center continues. At the Rhine Center now. And um, I think that uh, they still have some capacity down there to communicate this kind of thing, mm -hmm. uh, the, the importance of uh, good, solid training in, in, this, in this field and provide some opportunities for that. Mm -hmm. I haven't been down to the Summer Institute for some time, but uh, when I, I did... So all times, is not lost. Uh, come, Just because you something. enjoyed it, there, there's room for uh, possibilities in the future, no, of course. Lost at all. It's, <laughs> that's it's good, that's here. good. That's good. So you mentioned your interest in physics. What is that what really drew you to the field, the bigger question of the universe? Or right. had you come in contact with any psychic phenomena yourself that led you to that? I, I had not, I, you know, let me put it this way. It's very curious. I had a maternal grandmother who had a number of waking psychic, what looked like psychic experiences, um, and uh, involving even what might be a sort of uh, hallucinatory aspect. But uh, the interesting thing is, I never even knew about that stuff. They kept you know, that until from you, the I family? got directly involved with research in parapsychology, was already well on the way to getting a PhD degree. Then my mother said, "By the way, did you know that your grandmother had a oh, out of the this, closet this yet? Now maybe maybe there's something genetic in there that might incline uh -huh. some of us to to take an interest in these kind of things. I don't know, but uh, I would say that it wasn't the influence of anything uh, like uh, personal experiences in the immediate family. Even my I, I have an identical twin brother who practices as, 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 as a uh, actually huh. as a practicing psychic for a long time, mm -hmm. and uh, but uh, it, it, it wasn't it wasn't anything he did uh, at all that that got. He me didn't into practice the field. some of your experimental it, protocols at, no, at a young age. No, I mean, no. you know, didn't get well, him to toss I, dice I or something. Not, but, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, I did lots of experiments with cards and with uh -huh. dice. And, Things like that. While I was still in high school, uh -huh. I developed my own gravity run. Because that's pretty uh, cool to have your own personal shuffler. subject. I mean, that's really <laughs> yeah at hand. You know, yeah. really. No, I, I I I have to say honestly that the thing that really really excited me about the field of parapsychology was that if these things really happen, they provide some kind of new perspective on the nature of the world. And I didn't presume what that was. I mean, I read lots of people who had opinions about what mm -hmm. the explanations were. But the excitement was, there's something here. Can we get a hold of it scientifically? Mm -hmm. And it sounds as, uh, as you become very animated speaking about that, you still sh uh, continue to have this excitement. And we obviously haven't gotten to the answers yet. That's, you know, that's an important thing. We, we, I, my own personal speculation for what it's worth is that we may be closer to that in some respects than we have been before. I would, not in a few moments' time we have here, speculate that, about that at length. But I think that our research may be drawing some light upon some of these issues. Uh, I personally look forward to the day one day when people would stop thinking silly things like this stuff is, is, is paranormal or supernatural and would start to look at as part of the way the world is The human is condition? Built. I mean, you know, part the of the, the human world is condition. Built and we're part of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, what was your primary contact or your, yeah, your first contact with Parapsychology Foundation? I know we've been very happy to um, have you as a grantee and you've participated in some of our international conferences, but how did you come to... Uh, what was our first, when we first started dancing, for example? Well, I, I think I first heard about the Parapsychology Foundation, actually, from J.B. Ryan. Mm -hmm. And um, I couldn't tell you, being an awful historian, and not the best record keeper, except 
I dig back into my file somewhere, when the first time was that I had an actual grant from the Parapsychology Foundation. Uh -huh. But I, I had had a total of, of seven such grants, I know. Seven, lucky seven, seven huh? And they would have begun back in the 60s sometimes, I'm pretty sure. I can't even remember what the first project was, to tell you the truth. Uh -huh. But there's been quite a number of them over a wide variety of, 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 of topics. And I started early enough to have at least met Eileen Garrett. Oh, that was going to be one of my well, questions. Just one occasion. So, right. Yes, yes. Right. And what was your rea what was uh, what was your reaction to her? Was she in theatrical mode or was uh, it? Uh, I I wouldn't say high theatrical, but because uh, she had she had but, a penchant for being somewhat but flamboyant it, it, at times. She certainly, had very she certainly came across to being in charge, mm -hmm. and uh, she had no. Uh, I mean, there was nothing. Uh, equivocal about the way she presented herself or her mm -hmm. ideas or her opinions and uh, some of us just had a meeting with her one morning uh, around a, b a big table mm -hmm. and uh, I don't remember a lot of the conversation actually except mm -hmm. that um, I was impressed not just with that meeting but I was impressed with the fact that somebody who had been into mediumship or mediumship might not be the right word. Yeah, oh, yes. I guess mediumship, yeah, mediumship, definitely. voice channeling. Just, and, uh, yes, that exactly. Sort of she was a trans medium. Was, uh, was taking a perspective that says, I have had these things experiment experientially happen, but I really don't know, I really don't fully understand what's going on. It's time to get science involved and let something happen to, to try mm -hmm. to get scientific uh, elucidation of the, of, of the phenomena. Recurrent ambivalence that, that she really wanted the answers in that, much the same way that led you apparently to the field, no? Yeah, and, that, and that, that's so rare. That's, that's the thing that stuck out to me about uh, Eileen was that that is such an unusual kind of perspective. Yeah, you'd think that she wouldn't be looking yeah, for validation. Yeah, 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 for sure. Well, let me share with something with you. I've had the opportunity to sit down with Bob Morris, who, of course, you're very familiar with, and we're in mm -hmm. that circle at that period of time. And his recollection of his first meeting of Garrett, I suspect, I may be wrong, but it was probably the same meeting. And his recollection that he just uh, told me was that uh, Garrett was introduced to all of you somewhat in a line and apparently took each of your measure by looking into your eyes, you know, firm handshake. He remembered the firm handshake. And at the end of that, uh, somewhat nodded to um, to JB with the uh, motion that one and uh, Bob and I was dying to know who was the that one and apparently it's Bob's memory that the that one that she was pointing out was to Rex Stanford and his understanding of that 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 he was the one uh, for parapsychological research and you know, go on with his career, that one. So I don't know what that means, dear, well, but... she was right about me. That <laughs> one, there you go, there you go. <laughs> so I don't know for sure. So uh, just a little uh, interesting piece of... There. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But so uh, in any case, I want to... I know we don't have too much time, but what your thoughts are on present-day parapsychological research? Are you pleased with it? Or are you alternately not pleased with the the road that's taken? First off, let Regrets. me... Let me um, hedge a little bit by saying that I am not as up on all the current experimentation in literature as mm -hmm. I should be because for a few years now I've not been active as an experimenter myself and haven't been attending the conventions not because of lack of interest however but because I'm busy with a variety of things but um, the the I would have to say this given what parapsychology has been through given the strident attacks from various directions to try to discredit the field, undercut it in whatever way is possible. Uh, I am very pleased and happy about what we see in parapsychology today, and I still think there's a lot of promise in terms of uh, abilities to sustain a, a, a field, an active research field, uh, not just because of the intrinsic promise of the field itself, but because of the people that we have, and well-trained people available in this field. That's mm -hmm. tremendously exciting. Mm -hmm. There are things that I personally have some uh, concern about over the past uh, few 15 years or so in parapsychology. I will tell you candidly that I think too much time has been spent on Gunsfeld research. And I say that simply because I think that uh, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with doing Gunsfeld research. I've done some Gunsfeld research myself mm -hmm. and might even do some more if I had you know, the opportunity. But um, that's not the point. The point is that there's been too much focus upon you do some I would call almost magical procedure, and somebody's going to show sign. And uh, 
in my opinion, uh, this was never framed this paradigm enough in terms of understanding the process of what's going on there. Mm. I think that the progress of understanding the processes that we need to understand, they go on in the head when, when say, ESP events, whatever they are, occur. Uh, I think it's been somewhat held back by everybody focusing, almost every lab throwing a tremendous amount of resources into Gunspot research. Mm -hmm. Whenever you put all your eggs in one basket, there could be so problems. I'm not vulnerable. opposed to Gunspot research. More power to, if somebody can do a better Gunspot experiment, more power to them. But let's get on with the process of understanding this. Let's not get hung up on paradigms. I feel that way about all fields. Why do you think they, research. well, why has parapsychology gotten stuck on Gonsal? Is it because, because it's, it's measurable? Is it, I mean, no, why? No, I think it's, I think it's because Chuck Connerton in his uh, wonderful, convincing, and sometimes rhetorical way uh, convinced everybody that we have the royal road to replicability here. And mm -hmm. we got the magic bullet, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to do it. And, uh, you know, we're right, right on, on the edge and, and all this kind of thing. I, 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 don't, I don't see it that way. And uh, Chuck and I actually had discussions from time to time about when are you going to start to put together to find out what's really going on mm -hmm. in this kind of situation. Mm -hmm. uh, there are examples within the Gansfeld paradigm, for example, uh, of where I wanted Chuck to tighten up things to find out the locus of the effects he was getting. Like, for example, I really urged him. This was only a few months before his unfortunate Untimely death. death yeah. Yes. The, uh, the, the, I, wanted, I wanted him to pull that random event generator out of there and, and use some, some, uh, some means that were not subject to uh, possible uh, psychokinetic influences, mm -hmm. to use somewhat old-fashioned language. Mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, I, I wanted to find out where the locus of the psi events are, because Chuck himself had conceded, in, I think, in an perhaps his presidential address to the Parapsychological Association, that there was, um, that he showed evidence of ability to control a random event generator fortuitously to make targets come up in his experiments, if mm -hmm. I'm remembering the literature mm -hmm. correctly. Now, to me, you don't, we're not in parapsychology to w knock people over with p-values or anything like that. We're here to find out what's going on. And the first thing it seems to me we ought to do, if we so have we're not looking for the effect, effect out, per why se. Do we we want to know. If, if we get an effect, we need to know why it's there, what controls its occurrence, or we're not going to be able to replicate it. Sooner or later, somebody's not going to have the right form, they're going to feel like and say nothing to it, this is a bunch of junk. So I think it's a false hope to pin replicability on a single paradigm. You don't understand what's going on inside that mm -hmm. paradigm. Mm -hmm. if, um, if my the own inner Gunsfeld, workings are not understood. My, my own Gunfelt research was aimed at trying to find out something about the psychology of what goes on in that kind of setting. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, uh, we uh, looked at, try, we tried to examine the, uh, my co colleagues and I, mostly students, tried to examine the role of arousal and the noise that comes through the headphones on God felt and things like that. I don't care what question people want to ask, but let's not just worry about do we have replicability with a single paradigm. Let's ask ourselves, if we have success most of the time, why do we have it then but not the other times when we don't get it? We gotta, <laughs> we gotta pin that kind of thing down. We gotta confront the failures as much as we do the successes or we'll never learn anything. Mm -hmm. Is there any um, other um, research effort that's on the horizon that could be a close second to Gansfeld, or? Well, I hope it. it. I hope it won't be in the same sense of the word. Because otherwise, we're just repeating the same thing. Uh, right? I, I think we'd be repeating the same. But what I would regard as something of a mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't mean that doing Gansfeld was a mistake, but I think the field has got far too wrapped up in it. Uh, I have my own ideas about. Things you know, and they're pretty speculative. But you know, things that I find exciting and interesting that go in the field. But I wouldn't want to point to any one thing and say this is the way we ought to go now. Mm -hmm. I think each investigator has their own motivations, their mm -hmm. own things that intrigue them. People should be investigating the things that they think are personally exciting. But what I am trying to push is the idea that let's try to get a hold of the processes somehow or another in our research. We need to get close to the phenomena the way they operate inside people's heads and nervous system and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And so in other words, bring the humanness, I mean the human factor to the fore, rather than just, they're not laboratory rats just eliciting a response. Well, I, I, w I would say bring the kinds of factors that cognitive psychologists study in the, in the, in the picture. And cognitive psychology, in the broadest sense of the word, you have to include not only uh, perceptual, cognitive information processing types of things, but also you need to include things like roles of, uh, of arousal and motivation and these kinds of, of factors. But I put it this way, 
get close to the phenomena, try to find out how they're operating people's head, how they process information and under what circumstances they process specific types of information. Relate that to the results you are getting. Stay close to the phenomena. My own success in this field where I've had the most success and people have had success in replicating my results is when I'm dealing with things that are very close to the level of the phenomena themselves, like going against response biases or uh, uh, in terms of uh, certain types of changes in EEG patterns that suggest that people are getting a little alert because they're grasping a hold of the psi information coming into their heads and then they do mm. better. Uh, the, the, it, it's, it's getting close to the way the phenomena would have to operate in people's heads. To do that, you've got to have ideas. You've got to have theories, if you will. That's a kind of a grandiose hypothesis mm -hmm. about the mm -hmm. way things are functioning. You've got to so get creative thinking. and uh, really get creative as to think about our, our That's experiments. Right. It, really it, 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 it needs creativity. Having said that, it, it's not easy to capture creativity any more than it is to capture uh, psi functioning, right? I mean, this is no, a capricious sort of. Uh, but that's what scientists have been doing in all fields. That's where, that's where the, break, the breakthroughs come, come from, I think. Uh -huh. And we really need to. Parapsychology's got to be fun, it's got to be for the researcher. Uh -huh. as well as for the subjects, I think. Uh -huh. You've you, you, you got to have people excited about the phenomena, in, in the sense of excited about learning what's really going on, finding out what is happening and what is not, not happening. Uh -huh. and, it, and by the way, it's, it's important to, to, to be able to disprove uh, ideas about the way things function and to prove that they actually function. And in some ways, I think it's easier. Well, you obviously are so animated about experimental stuff, um, but you, in the meantime, with your career, you you move after the Rhine sojourn. Where did your career take you? Because now, obviously, you're teaching too. So, not every good experimentalist turns into a, an excellent teacher. And I know you've been at St. John's for years and uh, have been doing teaching. So, how did you make that segue, or was that a natural progression? Well, uh, it, in St. John's, like most university settings. Uh, if you teach, you're expected to do research. And uh, St. John's has had a nurturing environment for research. Mm -hmm. I mean, things like research reduction is for people that mm -hmm. are doing productive research. You don't have to teach as many courses. If you're not overloaded with courses, you've got time to think about it, do research and mm -hmm. to be a little more creative. So I found uh, St. John's to be a very compatible atmosphere mm -hmm. to do uh, some parapsychological research in, as mm -hmm. well as some of the other types of research that I've done. They've been supportive of research. And, uh, and I think that uh, the uh, I honestly think that it, at St. John's that the, uh, the Roman Catholic tradition might have played some role in, in, a, in a, a greater openness to parapsychology. Now, I would have thought perhaps with the hierarchy of the church and uh, dogma and this and that, it would have been exactly the opposite. No, I actually think it's the other way around because um, in order to be um, declared a saint, one has to go through a complex series of processes and mm -hmm. uh, so forth. I mean, it's usually posthumous. But the, uh, but, but the point is that things happen around people. Mm -hmm. So people that have investigated what happens around people that are, 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 are candidates for, for sainthood have found a lot of things happening. And it's interesting. So if you can swallow that, you can swallow. Well, there, 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 there are people who have written about this, who have been connected with these investigations, who say uh, there, are th there are natural phenomena that happen that look mysterious. We don't understand them yet. But we don't think they're acts of God mm -hmm. or anything like that. But they're natural phenomena. In other words, there are some writers and commentators on these topics within the, the church, that church, uh, who, um, who say uh, that uh, there are things there that are worthy of scientific investigation. And mm -hmm. uh, there was uh, a book called Parapsychology written by a Roman Catholic priest one time. The name skips my... Was it Heaney? No. No. Heaney? no. Uh, I thought I would remember that one, but I didn't. That's right. And, we can uh, play trivia later, but, uh, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. But uh, at any rate, no, th I, think, I think there is some kind of openness to this kind of thing. Uh, I don't think there's immediate things that's not, can't happen, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. But I, I have to say that I, I truly believe that the investigator who, say, working in parapsychology, I think they're going to be taken more seriously at their own university or wherever if, um, if, they, you know, if they do the research in the spirit that, that their academics want them to. In other words, as long as there's a scientific approach, I think there's a chance that, and, and, and one does one's work in a way that is respectable and solid and is able to defend it mm -hmm. in people's minds, why um, I, I think it's probably not going to be completely rejected. So it's People viable, may disagree. Chuck Connaughton is a fine example. He went to some of the biggest universities and talked about his work. But he presented it in a way that people understood that here isn't some kind of uh, crazy man running around trying to talk about miracles. 
Hmm. He's a man who has confidence in the scientific method. And I think that's a very important message, too, for mm -hmm. tolerance for parapsychologists. Mm -hmm. So then you've been continuing your experimentation. I mean, it's not just teaching at St. John's. Although you did do a sojourn, didn't you start your own organization down in Texas? Here's I had, I, well, I didn't start my own organization. Or I, I, I worked with a nonprofit organization for four years in parapsychological research mm -hmm. there. That, that's, mm -hmm. that's correct. And I must tell you that I actually missed teaching some during that time. You did. And I actually did. did teach a short uh, course at one point because it was hard to stay away from it. Uh -huh. When you're excited about a field, you want to talk about it with people. And teaching also helps you to get ideas. It also helps you to understand where you don't understand fully because students are the best in the world at asking those pointed questions. And so it's a, it's a great experience. I think teaching and research combine very well together. And uh, so uh, the university setting is, is where those is things get nice. a nice marriage. Yeah. Tell me, your students nowadays, do you find them any more or any less interested in parapsychology? Uh, than perhaps you in their place years ago, or because of the media, are they perhaps less interested because they know the buzzwords? I mean, I do you see I a difference? I, in I, 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 th I think that, um, well, I, let me put it this way. I have not taught the parapsychology altered stage course that's offered in the undergraduate psychology curriculum at St. John's University for some years now. I, I'm not sure how many years, whether it may be eight years or so. Something like that. Not because of lack of interest, but simply because uh, the person who taught that cognitive psychology courses there left, and uh, we didn't have anyone to teach that area. So I said, mm -hmm. I'll do that. I'm interested in that stuff. I'm, I'm, and it's, it's very important, fundamental to psychology nowadays, to teach cognitive, have someone to teach cognitive psychology in a department. Mm -hmm. So I did that, and I, I, I just simply haven't taught the course for that period of time. But let me tell you that during the last few years I taught, the, 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 the enrollment in the course was steadily growing. It was growing. It was That's... growing. People were very interested. People are, are uh, now, I have to say, it was altered states and parapsychology. So I talked about both so, altered yes, states and okay, parapsychology so it's a and wider... the possible relationship between the two. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, but no, students were very interested. There were, there were quite a few thoughtful students who enrolled in there, not just people interested in mysterious things or drug experiences or something like that, but all of it sort of came together. And, and, and the course grew. I was actually sorry to, to give it up. And I wouldn't have given it up except for a worthy cause. And who knows, mm -hmm. maybe before I retire, I'll teach it again. Oh, I would <laughs> hope so. I mean, what's in that noggin to impart, so Rex, I don't would think be? There's, I don't think there's any kind of uh, uh, thing that uh, people have lost the capacity to be interested in this. I, don't, I, I think that that interest is still there. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's see. In closing, then, what would be your, do you have like a wish list or the great experiment or something that either you could do or not necessarily the, 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 the experimental protocol, but what, what would you like to do or, or convince other people to do for parapsychology in, in research? Or is that a really that, that, difficult that, that, question that, to that, ask? That, that's a, a, a difficult question. I, mean, I would answer it from a, different, from a sort of a humanistic perspective. Uh -huh. I think people do the best research in areas that fundamentally really, really excite them. Problems that they have somehow got a hold of and made their own, whether they, where they have done a lot of study of the problem area, where they're puzzled by something, where they want a solution, they have a burning question. That's where people will take the time and effort to do the study right if they have proper training and background in science and methodology and that kind of thing. So I would say, find that thing that attracts you. Think mm -hmm. about it critically. Talk mm -hmm. about it with your friends and your colleagues who share your interests and maybe some who don't. Think about it. Be open to criticism. Plan carefully, whatever you do. Plan carefully. I think that is the key to doing good research in any field. I'm convinced of this. Sometimes I think that uh, people get taught in graduate school almost because of certain types of exams they have, that you should be able to concoct an experiment in uh, 40 minutes. Well, I would <laughs> hate to see the experiment I concocted in 40 minutes. Uh, and usually 40 days doesn't even start it. Uh, so I'm, I'm saying, let yourself get excited by something. And then let that drive and motivation lead you to the necessary hard work to do a good study. And that'll probably be your chances to really enhance your chances of finding out something useful and needed. Well, I thank you because it's obvious that you're well, still you. interested and still excited. So we'll look forward to more things. Thank you very you. much. All right. Thank you, Rex. <laughs>
Hi there. I hope you enjoyed today's selection. My name is Lisa Coley and I serve as president of Parapsychology Foundation. I hope you give us a like and if you have a comment then do so below and we'll try and better serve you. Any suggestions are welcome. And we want to thank very much our loyal subscribers. This is a relatively new channel and a new venture for Parapsychology Foundation so we very much appreciate uh, your loyalty. And if you haven't decided to subscribe, maybe pretty please you could.